Hello, welcome to the inaugural episode of Chapter 3 Podcast. This is a show for readers of science fiction, fantasy, and romance. I'm Bethany, your host, and joining me as a guest tonight is Liana from the YouTube channel Liana's Library. Today we'll be discussing dark fantasy and morally gray characters, and if any of you follow Liana, you know that this is a great topic for her. But first, it's time for On My Radar, where I share 10 upcoming book releases in science fiction, fantasy, and romance. The way this works is I will give you my top nine, and my guest will have the opportunity to share one of theirs. The books for today's episode will be released between October 3rd and October 16th, 2020. With the exception of the guest recommendation, they are free to suggest any future release they would like you to know about. Beginning with romance, on October 6th, we have Spoiler Alert by Olivia Dade from Avon Romance. This one's a romantic comedy with a plus-size heroine set in the world of fanfiction. She gets to go on a date with her celebrity crush who's secretly posting fanfiction of his own. This one sounds really fun. I'm excited to read it. Also releasing October 6th from Gallery Books, we have In a Holidays by writing duo Christina Lauren. This rom-com involves a time loop scenario a la Groundhog Day, but set during Christmas. A lot of people are excited for that one. Finally, on October 13th, we have a historical romance from Harlequin. This one is A Princess by Christmas by Julia London, and it follows a young widow turned investigative journalist who uncovers the identity of a prince in hiding. Moving on, let's talk about six speculative fiction releases. This encompasses sci-fi, fantasy, and related genre crossovers. We all know, especially right now, it can be hard to decide what is sci-fi and what is fantasy, so we're just going to call it all speculative for our purposes here. We have two books coming out on October 6th. First up, we are getting The Hollow Places by T. Kingfisher from Saga Press. This one straddles the line between science fiction and horror, as a young woman discovers a strange portal in her uncle's house leading to madness and terror. This one has been compared to Pan's Labyrinth by Guillermo del Toro and looks really interesting. Also on October 6th, we have a highly anticipated release from Tor. This one is The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V.E. Schwab, and it follows a young woman who makes a Faustian bargain to live forever, but is cursed to be forgotten by everyone she meets. Then on October 13th, I have four titles to talk about, so we've got a lot coming out that day. First up is Ring Shout by P. Jelly Clark, which is a dark fantasy historical novella from Tor.com, and this gives a supernatural twist to the KKK's Reign of Terror. I hear this one is really good and kind of twisted. So I'm excited to check that one out. From Little Brown Books for Young Readers, we have a debut YA fantasy, Beyond the Ruby Veil by Mara Fitzgerald, is dark and queer, following an ambitious socialite planning a marriage of convenience to her best friend. But she has a magical secret that could ruin all her plans. I hear this one is really bloody and twisty and should be a good time. Then from Orbit Books, we have The Once and Future Witches by Alex E. Harrow. If you have heard of her, it might be because last year her debut, The 10,000 Doors of January, did really well. Well, she's back with the second book. It is another historical fantasy, this time following the three Eastwood sisters, witches who join the suffragist movement of New Salem. Last one on my radar is finally from Saga Press, we are getting Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse. Really looking forward to this one. This is the first book in a fantasy trilogy inspired by the civilizations of pre-Columbian Americas. Tale of celestial prophecies, political intrigue, and forbidden magic. And from what I hear, it starts off with a bang. So I'm really excited to read this one. So with all of that said, please join me in welcoming Liana to the show. Hi, Liana. Hi, Bethany. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining me tonight. My absolute pleasure. If you want to briefly introduce yourself to our listeners and share your pick for an exciting upcoming release. Sure thing. Well, I think you introduced me pretty well that I read a lot of dark grim dark types of fantasy I do read other things as well but that is kind of my favorite go-to automatically intrigued area of the bookstore so even though I typically read straight up fantasy like the sword and sorcery grim dark kind of thing the pick I have for an upcoming release is actually uh I mean it is dark and it does have fantastical elements but it's not like a Joe Abercrombie book it's (laughs) a little different (laughs) That's okay. So it's The Devil in the Dark Water by Stuart Turton. This is the second book by the author who gave us The Seven Deaths of Evil in Hardcastle, or if you're an American, The Seven and a Half Deaths of Evil in Hardcastle. She dies more in America. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But only by half. (laughs) Yeah, so she's a little more dead. (laughs) So this is the second book. It is once again um, 
sort of like putting a somewhat fantastical macabre supernatural twist on a premise that isn't typically supernatural. The Seven and a Half Deaths was a sort of Gosford Parkian murder mystery in a closed circle type situation with a Groundhog Day type thing going on as well, where the character keeps waking up every day as a different person in the house, reliving the day of the murder. So here we've got another kind of murder story, but this is in in the 1600s and it's taking place on a ship. It's a detective, a detective who is actually supposed to be, uh, he's being transported to be executed, but en route to his own execution, there's people that start dying on the ship and there's some reason to believe something demonic might be involved. So he's kind of got to solve the murders on the ship that he's on bound for his own <laughs> demise. <laughs> It's a nice light reading. <laughs> it's a good fit for what we're talking about tonight anyway. And that comes out October 6th. Yeah, so go check that one out as well. Um, we'll put all of those in the show notes if you missed any of the titles. So tonight we're talking about dark fantasy. This could include grim dark fantasy, other types of dark fantasy. And we'll get into all of that. Morally gray characters. Both of us enjoy this, although I would say Liana is more more deeply into this side of fantasy than me. <laughs> so maybe we could start by talking about what is dark fantasy. There's kind of different subgenres of it. We could talk about what some of those are and why do we like it? Have you always been into this type of fantasy? Is it a newer thing? And you know, what's appealing about it? That might be an interesting place to start. For sure. Um, I would say darker fantasy is more something that has arisen in the more modern iterations of fantasy. I'm sure if I did my research, he's not the first one to have done this. But George R.R. R. Martin kind of started a trend of not having such heroic, magical wizard type fantasy and instead having these gritty, very gray characters where people die all the time and there's no good guys, there's no bad guys. It's a lot of war and blood and magic is really on the fringes of it. Yeah. So that has sort of, because of the popularity of that as well, uh, and the show certainly helped, then uh, other <laughs> authors have also explored, taken that idea and run with it and, and expanded on that in their own ways. Yeah. No, that's that's interesting. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about it with starting with Game of Thrones. I'm trying to think back in terms of earlier things, but but yeah, I mean, I think fantasy specifically... You know, maybe in sci-fi people would explore darker themes, but it's true. Fantasy was often much more of this heroic storytelling. And, you know, dark fantasy can sometimes have some element of that, but it seems like it wants to play more on the edges of moral grayness and complicated characters. And I think at least for me, that's what's so appealing about it. I find a morally gray villain or a complex villain much more compelling than kind of your mustache twirling everything is evil for no reason if that you know well i would say i mean fantasy certainly uh explore dark themes but i think the difference is that the, this newer sort of grim dark fantasy permits your protagonist to not be necessarily morally good or heroic or noble or self-sacrificing so i mean for lord of the rings is sort of the granddaddy of them all when it comes to like modern fantasy. We had for a long time copycats of Lord of the Rings. That was fantasy. And then now we have copycats of Game of Thrones. And so it goes. But uh, I mean, certainly there was, he was influenced by and there's debate to be had how much and how little it's directly influenced by his experiences with World War One and PTSD. And that's all present in Lord of the Rings. So there's dark themes for sure. The fact that Frodo right. comes back from this like ring quest. He's not unchanged. He's scarred and and he's shaped by it, but he's still, there's, Frodo is still a good guy and he's pure of heart and that's why he wins the day. So with authors like George R. R. Martin and Abercrombie on the scene, Frodo, if they were to write about Frodo, I have my doubts about the story being because he's pure of heart. There would be, if he, if he even succeeded in his quest, it would probably be by happenstance or because there was something in it for him. <laughs> <laughs> like the darker side of humanity i guess instead of you know good winning the day all the time which just make it more like easy to relate to as a human being because i don't think most of us to most of us read someone like frodo and you're like well i'm not pure of heart <laughs> like, <laughs> who is <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it, it's i mean i think it's interesting one thing that i recall being maybe one of the early introductions for me to this and maybe there was something earlier but it's is a TV show. I don't know if you ever watched Once Upon a Time. The, Dis the Disney characters? Yeah. 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 
I found that to be so interesting, this idea of humanizing these evil villains and making them more complicated characters. Something about that was very different and I think compelling for me. And I know it's not exactly what we're talking about with like grim dark fantasy, for instance, but something of, you know, not all supposedly good characters might get their happy endings or some of these villainous characters might be more complicated than what they've been seen as, you know, having Regina as the evil queen have her own kind of love story, for instance. I think there was something about that that started drawing me into wanting to read villain backstories. And I think maybe for me, that might have been a gateway into some of more of what I've read since then. I think you bring up an interesting point. I mean, not just uh, the show itself, because I mean, Rumpelstiltskin also is, he could easily be transported right. into an Abercrombie story. And yeah. get right in. <laughs> Hang out with Galacta, you know? Yeah. Um, but before even that show, I think uh, the show took its cues from the popularity of Disney villains. If you look at the merchandising history, if you mm. look at how, I mean, there was an, I remember, I don't think that store is there anymore, but I remember at Disneyland, there used to be an entire store devoted to villain merchandise. It was specifically for that. And I mean, it goes to show that people have an appetite for and feel a connection to and identify with on some level, the villainous characters who more often than not display more human frailty that your the protagonists don't right and i think that the, the popularity of that was recognized and examined and incorporated by the brand <laughs> yeah no it's interesting and well and then now you've gotten you know i've never actually read them but i know they have these twisted tales that they put out which i think are mm -hmm. darker versions of the you know normal fairy tales and i i think that's that mm -hmm. is interesting it does seem to be something that's been capitalized on but you mentioned joe abercrombie who i know is a favorite <laughs> author of yours i've read one one of his books at this point and i did like it and intended to read more but um i'm i'm a, <laughs> at the risk of being rude to my host you've read two of his books have i oh i did because i didn't like the first one <laughs> yep i didn't either i just, I just <laughs> blocked it out of my memory <laughs> <laughs> It's like, we'll just forget about that first experience and pretend it was the positive second one. I tend to forget about that as well because I didn't care for it. <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah, no, I, well, and it's, it's interesting because it's, oh, what, what is it? The half, the half king? Half a king. Half a king. The series of the Shattered yes. Sea. Yeah, I, I know there are people who love it, but I was not a fan. But then I read the first book in the first law series and that I did really like and I see the appeal. So, mm -hmm. which he wrote the first law first. Well, and also for a different audience, because um, first law was for adults, yeah. and I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want, but I want. To, it's so funny, I can't believe I ever got to read two of them. But yes, I, <laughs> <laughs> I did really like that one, and I want to read on. And it's always interesting to me hearing you talk about it, because I think when I first heard you review the books before I had read them. I expected them to be this super dark, violent thing all the time. And they're not the most violent, awful thing I've read, you know, just in terms of the experience of reading it. But it's interesting because I think maybe the reason it's grimdark is something other than just pure amount of violence and death, for instance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think what makes it grimdark is, again, the fact that the characters that you're following are frequently doing morally reprehensible things even if they're not violent things so i mean for sure one of the main characters one of the pov characters is an inquisitor aka a torturer so i mean yeah he's <laughs> he's committing violence for a living and you obviously have, it's a sword and sorcery type of setting so you've got you know people with swords so you've got a lot of that going on but a lot of it is just to do with their motivations, I think. The fact that the characters aren't motivated by the selfless noble thing. They're not setting out on a hero's quest in order to save the world because it's the right thing to do. Literally, no one is doing the right thing. They're doing the right thing for themselves at best. And even then, they're often their own worst enemies. So it's that focus on the sort of dark side of human desire, motivation, what drives us a lot of the, the Abercrombie tends to include a lot of internal monologues for his characters. Mm -hmm. So you get a lot of the people put on a heroic face often or say they're going to do the right thing or the noble thing uh, because they know that people want to hear it. 
But inside, the real reasons for doing it is because they want a promotion or because they know that it looks good politically or because they know that if they say anything different, they'll get in trouble. Right. So it's not, you know, a hero for hero's sake. Right. Yeah. And it's interesting because even in terms of the direction of the overall plot across all the characters, it seems like things happen more because of political expediency among different forces and less because there's some good to be achieved at the end of it. Yeah, yeah, uh, most definitely. I know that Abercrombie is influenced by Machiavelli. So the politics that he brings to the table tend to be quite corrupt and ruthless and self-serving. So Mm -hmm. there's no, nobody comes out of it smelling like a daisy. The people who are supposed to be the noble knights are anything but... The people who are supposed to be taking the people's quote unquote ultimate good and welfare uh, as their main driving factor in their decisions, they're usually not. They're they're power hungry politicians. So everybody is out for number one. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting that that's one sort of take on it. And I don't know. You've read more of him than I have, but I'm curious if it's something where he's trying to make a larger commentary. And the reason I say that is, I think it would be interesting to compare it to, for instance, The Poppy War by R.F. Kuang in that series, which is arguably also grimdark fantasy. But I think it's clear that it has a reason for doing what it's doing, Um, which Mm -hmm. in that case, I think is unpacking the problems of war, the realities of what it's like, and colonialism. So it's it's interesting. She clearly has specific things she's wanting to talk about. And I don't know if you feel like Joe Abercrombie has that or if it's more random or what it is that appeals to him about writing those stories. Um, so I would say, I mean, he had very specific projects in mind when it came to the trilogy and the standalones that came directly after it. But if we're co- talking about something more akin to what RF Kuang's doing, some more specific, relevant social or political or cultural commentary. I would say Joe Abercrombie's new series, which does still take place in the universe of the first law, uh, but takes place some years later. Mm. It's very apparent, uh, very, very apparent that he's heavily influenced by the rise in populism and industrialization. And, and that kind of thing is woven into the story a lot more. So you get the sort of like Marxist, you know, people being divorced from the object of their labor. You get the whole idea of sort of like union labor and and workers being mistreated, machines replacing humans, people being unsatisfied, going hungry, the rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer. Like there's a ton of that in his new series. And it's really driving the plot. Interesting. I think it's, it's so fascinating to me when people use speculative fiction as a way of talking about larger issues or larger ideas. I think specifically with dark fantasy, it certainly does allow you to address some of these darker and grittier elements of humanity in, in different ways. So it's interesting that he's kind of taking a more, a, more of an approach to different political ideas or things in history yeah i need to read more of him (laughs) (laughs) basically i would always say that (laughs) and i guess for for people who are listening who maybe haven't read much in dark fantasy what do you think is a good place to start whether it's with joe abercrombie or other authors well so i the question you asked earlier that i didn't really answer (laughs) i did a politician's move and just answered whatever question i wanted to answer (laughs) Uh, but you asked if I had like always read dark fantasy or where I started or when I started or how that came to, uh, came into my reading diet. Mm-hmm. And I absolutely did not read dark fantasy to start with. And I don't think that I can't speak for every human, but I think dark fantasy is something that appeals more and more the older that you get, because yeah. uh, when you're a kid, you, you know, fairy tales and you're supposed to be learning fables and learning your moral compass from stories a lot of the time. That doesn't mean you can't be exposed to more gray topics. But I was reading, you know, very heroic and positive and Tolkien-esque type fantasy. And the very first time that I picked up Abercrombie, it was in the midst of that. And I did not know that Abercrombie was not that way. It was just in the fantasy section. You know, there's like a parchment-y cover with some a dagger on it. And I was like, yeah, it's fantasy. <laughs> and I read the first book and I was like, why would anybody read this? Everyone is terrible. This is awful. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and and when you're a kid, right, everything is so black and white in terms of morality. Mm -hmm. And I think it does take living longer often. I mean, sometimes that's not true, but often living longer, you see, well, 
maybe things are not as simple as you thought they were. I mean, just the the fact of someone like Sand and Galacta, who is probably my favorite character in literature oh, ever. He's so great. <laughs> but so part of what's great, I think, is something that a kid has no, uh, doesn't have the requisite experience to appreciate him because, oh, part of what appeals about, many things appeal, but part of what appeals about Sand and Galacta is his internal monologue when he's faced with the ineptitude of his bosses and the the groveling that he has to do outwardly and the internal venom <laughs> that is going on when he's absolutely seething at their stupidity, their uselessness, their obvious ambition. And <laughs> they ask him uh, like really dumb questions that frustrate him. And of course, he vocally answers them, you know, yes, whatever you want, you're the boss. But in his head, which once you actually had a job and you've had a dumb boss, which as a teenager, you probably haven't, you can appreciate needing to grovel to the boss and inside absolutely losing your shit. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, anybody who's worked in any kind of customer service oriented thing yeah. as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's it's true. And I, I think that's part of what is so funny about Glockta is internally he says all of these things. And it's yeah, it's it's hilarious. He's a great character. And I've said before, um, more recently to people, but also just in general that like, I find it oddly uplifting. Because if you read something very heroic and positive, then if you're placing yourself in the shoes of these characters or comparing yourself to them, you're never going to measure up to the noble knight that gets sacrifices all and the noble knight's boss or king is also noble and sacrificing all and you're like, my boss is horrible. And I honestly don't feel like sacrificing much for these people because I don't feel like they're super grateful. So when you read someone like Abercrombie, you're like, yeah, that's that's more like how it is. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, that's such like a pessimistic view. I mean, I, I get it because I think oftentimes it isn't. But I, I, I have to say, I still love the heroic side of fantasy. Oh, too. Sure. I just now I like both because I think that that exists in the world. I just think it's much more rare than we want it to be when we're young. You know, I, just, I feel like there's a point where so like, uh, on the one hand, hopeful type fantasy can be aspirational and inspirational. But there comes a point where an overabundance of that in your liter in your reading diet can start to make you feel either frustrated or inadequate or or dissatisfied with the world because everything yeah. is just so noble and so good and yeah. it isn't so peppering in some grim dark where things are a little more like how things are is it's it's a good balance <laughs> yeah no i would agree i'll go back to what i was asking earlier for anybody listening who is interested in dipping their toes into dark fantasy where would you suggest that they start well, I think it's important to know the type of reader you are in general, and the type of story that appeals to you, positive or negative. Like if you're really interested in history, if you're a big history buff, then you have, I mean, George R. R. Martin is unapologetic about how much he's influenced by the War of the Roses. So if you're a big history buff, you're going to appreciate all of the references and the influence that has on his work. Or again, like R.F. Kuang with the Poppy War. Uh, again, a very heavy influence from history. So if that's something that appeals to you, then you probably want to start there because the grim dark side of it is there, but through line that will get you hooked from what your previous reading might have been would be perhaps other historical fiction or uh, historical inspired fantasy or just straight up nonfiction of history. Versus if you like a lot of action and battle and you like a lot of swords and blood and a lot of that, then you have people like, oh, who's the author with the powder mage? Uh, books where it's very war centric Abercrombie um it's not a ton of that but it is it is quite a bit of you know blades and blood and mm -hmm. battle and hand-to-hand -hand combat so if that's what yeah. you like then you've got people like Abercrombie there's also which Abercrombie does far less of but there is a really dark fantasy that does include a lot more of the magical so like really disgusting and horribly twisted creatures and monsters and magics that warp and twist the mind or the body or the soul. So if again, if you're more fascinated by all kinds of dark magics and you don't want your fantasy to be so gritty and realistic, <laughs> like because George R. R. Martin and Joe Abercrombie tend more towards realism in their fantasy. Yeah. And the fantasy part is very light. So if you want more monsters and that kind of thing, more fantastical fantasy, then again, then look for something like The Witcher or uh, Ed McDonald's right. Ravensmart trilogy where you got like yes. tons of, you could have a whole bestiary with the stuff they've yeah. got in there. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think too, you're starting to see some of this because every, I, I think at this point, everything we've talked about mostly has been adult fantasy, mm -hmm. which is great. But if you want something targeted at a younger audience, there are starting to be more dark fantasy 
stories getting published in YA as well, which are things that I've enjoyed. I think a couple good examples would be Three Dark Crowns by Kendara Blake is a good one. It's about three princesses who have to fight to the death to decide who's going to become queen. <laughs> and it's got lots of drama and backstabbing. I, I would call that probably a dark fantasy. And going back to kind of these fairy tale villain stories, a favorite that I like to recommend to a lot of people is Forest of a Thousand Lanterns yes. by Julie C. Dow. So good. It's a retelling of Snow White, but it's the backstory of the evil queen set in a magical version of ancient China. And it's just fantastic. Really, really great. <laughs> you want a good villain backstory. So I think we're starting to see it crop up in other places as well, which I think is interesting. I think there's some interesting bridging mechanisms that I've seen in YA where it's they're they're not books that I would call grimdark fantasy or even YA grimdark but they're starting to have more morally gray characters or having slightly unnerving monsters like bringing in some of those elements where I still wouldn't call the book itself you know a dark fantasy book I mean like the cruel prince by Holly Black that you have these questionable morals for the main characters which is something that's a good flavor for what that's like to have characters that aren't necessarily the good guys <laughs> all the time uh, to start to whet your appetite for more of something like that. Yeah. Well, and I think that's interesting, More having morally gray characters in YA stories and children's literature in general. I feel like that is a new development. I think that that probably would have been very controversial in the past when moralistic children's literature was really what was being pushed. It, I mean, a perfect example from, you know, history would be Louisa Malcott getting pushed to publish Little Women if she wanted to have a bestseller and have it have this kind of moralistic side of it. And I, I love it. I think Little Women is fantastic. But she also wrote these very dark <laughs> fantastical stories and if you ever get the chance to pick up a collection of them they're fascinating and they're really good but but yeah I mean I think for teenagers and for children people really wanted something that was going to didactically tell them what they should be doing with their lives and with their morality I'm not sure that I would have thought of it in these terms before right this moment but I think a lot of the trend you're describing is prioritizing what the child wants over what the parent thinks the child needs because kids have always been interested by dark. Like, they always want to be told a ghost story. They always want to be told something creepy and dark. They're going to sneak in and find the Goosebumps books. Like, they're going to sneak right. in and look at the R-rated movie their parents are watching. Like, they always want to see the scary, dark things. And they're probably less likely to be scared by it because they don't have the adult experience to really contextualize the darkness of it. So mm -hmm. kids have an appetite for it. And ki if you look at kids' make-believe games, they can be so dark. <laughs> so... <laughs> Kids want it. And it's more that we're, we're no longer listening to parents say, no, 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 they must be taught what is right and wrong. We're listening to what mm -hmm. children say they want to read. Well, and I think there's something to be said also, and this is more of what I'm, I'm hearing, you know, having children of my own. <laughs> at this point. But, uh, you know, I'm hearing more too about people discussing it as a coping mechanism for processing the real world, that especially fantastical stories that are darker can be part of how kids cope with things that are going on that are hard to explain or hard to deal with. And it's funny, you know, I hear my kids talking the other day, my, my, my for those who are listening, I have a six-year-old and a almost four-year-old. And the six-year-old was telling the four-year-old a story about a pirate. And he was like, and the pirate sailed the seven seas. And then the ship went down into the water and the pirate died. And it was really sad that he died. And he was my friend, but he made this pencil. <laughs> <laughs> random and funny but it was the, the the drama of the death of this pirate and the little one was just like <laughs> riveted to the story he lives on in the pencil <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, I think that's a thing that uh, J.M. Barry captured quite well, because if you think about Neverland, this paradise for children, what is it filled with? Violence. <laughs> it's pirates and Indians and killer mermaids. And they're like, kids are like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. I mean, I think there's there's something about that. Well, and, you know, the world is a place that is not always as controllable as you want it to be. And I think mm -hmm. about, especially for kids right now, with, you know, COVID happening, and they're coping with all the differences from the virus and the way that that bleeds into things. Um, I swear I will not talk about ch children's stories all night. But <laughs> tonight, 
my six-year-old lost his first tooth, which, by the way, speaking of, like, freaking out about blood, that was (laughs) (laughs) was the thing. But um, it was funny because we put, you know, under the pillow for the tooth fairy, and he was like, but mom what about the virus? What if the tooth fairy gets the virus? I'm like, I was like, well, she probably has a very small mask. (laughs) (laughs) So he's like, oh, okay. That makes sense. Wait till he starts asking where she's getting the money. Oh, man. Yeah. (laughs) There's a lot of world building questions when it comes to the tooth fairy. There are, true. You know, this came up with Santa also of like, mom, we don't have a, have a chimney. And I was like, oh, that's true. He's like, well, he can come up in the elevator. I was like, yeah, that works. Right. He's adaptable. <laughs> yeah. Like we're in Manhattan. We don't have a chimney. Yeah. Like an apartment building. But I mean, without being an expert in like the history of children's literature, arguably the, the notion of sanitizing children's literature is a pretty modern idea in and of itself. Like it's not, if you think about history, I mean, if you look at the real Grimm's fairy tales, they were very frightful and intended to frighten children. If you look at yeah. kids' nursery rhymes, like uh, Ring Around the Rosies is about the plague. The kids mm-hmm. were dealing with and coping with and learning about the dark world they inhabited through story, through song. And so it is this almost, sort of, I, I would imagine, although again, I'm not an expert, but I would imagine it's around about the Victorian era that we started sanitizing children's literature and started making, putting little bows on it and saying, everything is happy dappy and everyone is good and noble and you learn how to be good mm-hmm. from this. And I think we're almost unlearning this brief period of madness <laughs> and being like, yeah. no, children should, uh, can and should be exposed to darker ideas. Right. Well, because otherwise you get, you know, kids going off to college and then their parents are calling their professors because they're upset because they didn't do well in class or something. I mean, you know, yeah. you end up with like this whole generation of mm-hmm. like over coddled children. Yeah. I mean, childhood has not always been what it is now, for sure. So I know we had talked previously and you'd mentioned that you've been thinking about subgenres of grim dark fantasy and dark fantasy. And I'd be curious to hear about that of how do you sort of categorize these different types of grim dark fantasy? What are they? Yeah, well I sort of touched on that before in terms of like where to where to start with it is knowing what type you want. So again, I would say that there is the war and battle centric type of fantasy. There's the monsters and dark magic type of fantasy. There's Mm -hmm. the historical basis, speculative fiction version of actual historical events. I have notes. I came up with five categories. Those are three. There are two others. (laughs) (laughs) But so, uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like once we sort of open the floodgates to to permitting authors to not have Frodo Baggins as their hero, they ran in all different directions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because I'm realizing I sometimes like dark fantasy and sometimes I don't, depending on who it's centering and what it's doing. I just had this thought that The Magicians by Lev Grossman would probably be considered dark fantasy there are not heroes or good guys or bad guys. It's morally gray characters. There's not really a point to what they're doing, which I think is part of why I I hated it. I know a lot of people love it. I have not seen the show. So like maybe the show would be fine, but I didn't like it. And I think for me, I was told that this was going to be like if Hogwarts was college, you know, mm-hmm. instead of high, instead of elementary school, high school and stuff, um, which it is not. <laughs> like, that's not what this was. Um, but I, so my expectations going in were not, what it was. But then also, I think I just hated reading from the perspective of this whiny, privileged white guy who, you know, like who thinks his life is so terrible when it's not. And I just was like, had no patience for it. See, I think there's a trick to that, though, because if you think about because you liked the blade itself, and what you just yeah. described on paper, that's Giselle Dan Luther. And I'm sure you enjoyed reading about Giselle Dan Luther. <laughs> Yeah, I guess the difference is if it reads to me as self-aware, like the author knows that that's what they are. Mm -hmm. And I don't think maybe it would be different if I read it now, but at least in the way it lives in my memory, I didn't read it as the author being self-aware of how privileged the character Mm -hmm. actually was. Mm -hmm. So that might be part of it. Is it's different if it's like a, co- a meta sort of commentary on it. I don't mind characters like that if if the authorial intent seems to be that they know that's what's going on and they're making a point with it. Which I think is often the trick with writing good dark fantasy is because 
there's a difference between incorporating dark concepts and even having your protagonist doing dark deeds and believing dark things. It depends on if the author is condoning it in their tone, right. uh, if they're just explaining it and, and telling you about it versus promoting it in a way. Yeah. Well, I think similarly, it's part of why, you know, for instance, in a, in a darker fantasy, you might have something like rape that takes place. And mm-hmm. there's a difference between reading it where it feels gratuitous and it feels mm-hmm. like it's doing it for shock value or doing it because there's like some gleefulness Mm -hmm. you know, behind the writing of it versus something where it's intentional. And yes, it's dark and it's terrible, but it's doing it to uncover something or say something about, you know, a larger has some larger meaning to it. And I think those are two very different things. The first I don't like it feels gross. It feels like if it's fetishized. Yeah, if it's fetishized, exactly. That I don't like, but it is a reality. And so I don't mind having it addressed if it's done in a proper way. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I have seen uh, people express the view that they believe that rape should never be in a book. Like, there's no reason to have it in there. Absolutely, you can write every book without it, and it doesn't need to be in there. And I would disagree. (laughs) I would say that there's very poor ways of handling it, and that it should always be handled with care. The author should be very intentional about when they're choosing to incorporate that. But I feel like that's true of most story elements. And so I feel like an author needs to treat rape the way they would really treat any other piece of the story. Is this essential to the story that I'm telling? Does this do something essential to illustrate a point about my character, my world, or the events of this story? And if the answer is no, then it doesn't need to be there. And if the answer is yes, okay, now are we going to focus in on it so much that it becomes pointless? Or are we putting enough in there so you understand what happened and why it's here? Yeah. And so I've seen it done well and I've seen it done very poorly. I would agree with you. I think I think it's something that we can have on the page. It is something that should be addressed. Well, and partly because it is unfortunately and sadly a fairly common human experience. I mean, we talk Mm -hmm. about that one in four women experiences Mm -hmm. sexual assault in their lifetime. This is something that many people are experiencing. And yes, you need to use care in the way that you approach it and deal with it. But to just leave it out as if it doesn't exist, I think takes away from something that we should be in conversation with. Yes, it erases the lived experience of so many people. Absolutely. And that's not, that is equally reprehensible to unmask, completely delete the existence of such things in war or in just a specific depraved individuals. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think similarly, this is part of why I'm, not against having some of those darker things if they're handled appropriately in young adult literature as well. Mm -hmm. When I see some people saying, well, this isn't appropriate for teenagers. And I always think, well, there are teenagers who are living this. (laughs) And, you know, there should be books that are addressing that. Yeah. And, And it's always interesting. Those are always books that get to be very controversial where people are like, this is, this is terrible there was like a big one last year. I could remember what it was. A YA book? Yeah, it was a YA book that was very controversial. And I actually made a video about it because it was Because so it had the rape? Yeah, because, well, because it had rape and it had other forms of sexual assault in it and it was pretty graphic. And there were people who were like, this is not appropriate for teenagers. You know, there are teenagers who are experiencing that though. So Mm -hmm. how do you say that that should never exist? I think we sometimes underestimate teenagers and children and their ability to deal with information. Not just underestimate them, but I mean, because people contextualize their own experience based on what they see represented in media and in literature. And so Mm -hmm. often you understand yourself based on comparing yourself rightly or wrongly, but you do it. People do it. There's no stopping it. When you see something you've experienced depicted in a story it in a way legitimizes the experience and makes you feel like, okay, so it isn't this weird one-off thing. There's nothing wrong with me. This isn't something that Mm -hmm. only happened to me. This is something that people know about enough to where it's in a book and people are like, yeah, this is a thing that happens. So to have it there. And then as a warning almost, I mean, Grimm's fairy tales were (laughs) horrific because you've got to scare children so that they don't die. (laughs) (laughs) So I mean, in that sense too, like if you don't know that's a thing that could ever happen to you because you shouldn't Mm -hmm. ever no kid should ever without being told that this is a thing that happens ever come to the conclusion that this is an option for a thing that could happen to them so having it in a book is a way of uh, introducing this as a thing that could happen to be wary of 
and to yeah. more and especially young women but you know men as well men that happens yeah. to men too so to have it in a story where they can be like oh i didn't know i need to worry about this but apparently i need to worry about this <laughs> there are a lot of young women who do experience sexual assault at a pretty young mm-hmm. age so it's not sadly like not that uncommon i did find the book <laughs> the book <laughs> i was thinking of is um damsel by alana k arnold oh i do remember you talking about that yeah. Well, it was one that I think too was sold as a fairy tale, was promoted mm-hmm. as a fairy tale. And it's really more of a horror novel kind of wrapped <laughs> up in the trappings of a fairy tale that's dealing with sexual assault and misogyny. <laughs> 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 you know, like marketing teams sometimes need to get it together. But yeah, I it was one that I really loved and I thought was fantastic. And I did think, you know, maybe not all teens should read it, but I'm glad mm-hmm. that that exists. This. But mm-hmm. it was a very controversial one where there are people on Goodreads reviews saying this is pornographic, this is wrong, no teenager should be reading this, and protect the children. You know, this always kind of comes up, I feel like. Well, I think there's a, it's sort of a, it's doing more harm than good when I've seen YA purport to have a morally gray character who never actually does anything morally gray. Sort of uh, reinforces the idea that for them to be the protagonist, they can't really do anything bad. You can't really follow support or empathize with this character if they've really done anything bad they have to ultimately in the wash come out smelling like a daisy so i really found it refreshing like if we contrast i didn't finish the series but in the beginning of the throne of glass series we're told that selena sardathian is a like the greatest assassin but on page she doesn't do any assassinating that she i know she does later but like when your introduction to this character is like she's supposedly an assassin really all she's doing is sort of more or less noble things. And like, I guess she was an assassin, but we don't really see that versus someone like Cass Brecker and Lee Bardugo's books where he's got a rough reputation for being a pretty terrifying individual and a pretty ruthless one. And on page, he does do ruthless things that support that reputation. And he's still your protagonist. He's still, because it's complicated and he does do also morally good things. So it's not all one or the other. Yeah, no, definitely. And I, you know, I think this ties into as well for teenagers, for adults, allowing space for women to be messy and morally mm-hmm. gray, not just villainous, like witch mm-hmm. women or something, but but instead of having this dichotomy of women being either evil witches or seductresses versus being good sort of angels who are perfect all the time. I think allowing space for women to be human on the page is important for teenagers and for adults. And I think one series that, again, some people don't like because of this that I love is the Imperium Trilogy by Claire Legrand. Yes. um, (laughs) (laughs) Love it. (laughs) I think is, uh, is Kingsbane? The first, first one or the second one? I can't remember. Uh, um, that's uh, it's the second one. I haven't read it actually. <laughs> okay, it's good. It's also very, very good. But yeah, but that's part of what I love about those books is they have messy female characters who mm-hmm. are given space to make mistakes and to grow up and to find themselves. And sometimes they can be heroic, and sometimes they can be more villainous. And they are they they exist in this moral grayness, which is what much of humanity is like. And I just think that's so important, especially for women who are often told that they are one thing or another, which just isn't true or shouldn't have to be true. Yeah. And I mean, I think the when I think about the stories I was consuming during formative years, I don't know that nothing was available, but it I certainly wasn't aware of it. So I did I wasn't exposed to it. So the stories that I was exposed to during those years, they didn't have females being complicated, messy. They didn't have females having agency. They didn't have females being the heroes in the story. They didn't have them taking, like, if they're heroes in the story, it's because they are the damsel. (laughs) So, I mean, the way that you get to be part of the action is by being the wife or being the side, you know, the, you get to be Arwen to the Aragorn. That's how you get to be involved, Uh, you know? And so I found myself typically fantasizing about just like, Basically, so apparently Peter Jackson had the same fantasy because like my daydreams and, and imagination would like insert a Toriel type character, which was inserted into Hobbit to be like, mm. well, what if one of these elves, one of these knights was a lady with some daggers and she also went to do the <laughs> fellowship? Like that was what sort of yes. my headcanon was. And I was just like, well, what if we just like gave us some boobs and she went too? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, and I think... <laughs> 
I'm happy to see that there is more getting published now that is making more space for that. Not to mention making space in fantasy stories for people who are trans or Mm non-binary. And that's something that is just starting to happen in publishing as well. And, you know, hopefully being able to have characters who are people where they don't have to be perfect or they don't have to be Mm -hmm villains because of this one thing about them. So we've covered one favorite author of mine, but I'm about to bring up the other one. So I (laughs) hope you're ready to take a shot. But Neil Gaiman. (laughs) (laughs) Can you ever not bring up Neil Gaiman, Leah? (laughs) It's in my contract of life that if there's a day goes by that I don't mention Neil Gaiman, I get a demerit. Um, (laughs) But uh, he handles, I think... uh, he kind of writes for all ages. He's got middle grade. I don't know that it's anything he's written has ever been shelved as YA, but he's got some sort of mm-hmm. older range middle grade. And then he's obviously got adult literature and he's got some like children's children's fiction. Um, but I think he handles that very well. The idea of introducing dark themes, dark topics in a way that is both enticing and accessible to children. His children's stories tend to be <laughs> dark even for me as an adult, but I don't think that they're when I say that I'm like oh it's dark for me and I'm an adult I don't mean that to be like this shouldn't be for kids I mean it's absolutely should be for kids I'm just saying that like what frightens a child can and maybe should also frighten an adult and there's nothing wrong with that <laughs> you know it's a shared experience mm-hmm. the, the the what scared you as a kid has definitely has the power to continue to scare you <laughs> as an adult yeah no I think Neil Gaiman does a great job of that of of getting at darker things in a way that helps you maybe think about them or about I and I and I think that's the thing is like those stories and it's probably also why goosebumps were super popular with kids when I was growing up these things can allow a safe space for kids to cope with and explore and deal with their very real fears but in a space where it's not actually going to hurt them right it's it's a book <laughs> you can close the book if you need to, you can come back to it. <laughs> and much like we were saying about how you have to be very conscious and considered when you're including something like rape in a book. Uh, likewise, you can't just be like, oh, you okay, so they just put dark stuff in kids' books. So uh, just do it. It's not true. I mean, Neil Gaiman is very deliberate in which dark things and how he does dark things in kids' lit to the point where like, I remember he tweeted at one point that he went into a bookshop because he frequently, if he's passing a bookshop, he'll stop in and be like, do you have any of my books? I'll sign them. So he was making one of his rounds and he went into a bookshop and because he writes a lot of kids lit, they decided that everything that he writes is kids lit. And they put all Neil Gaiman's books in the kids section. And Neil Gaiman tweeted, please don't put Ocean at the End of the Lane in the kids section. No good can come from this. (laughs) Because again, like he, the Coraline is very dark, but Neil Gaiman recognizes the difference between Coraline, which is written for children and the ocean at the end of the lane, which has a child protagonist, but is in no way intended for a child to read. And there's there's a difference. <laughs> there absolutely yeah. is. Yeah, no, that's interesting. So we are nearing the end of our time. We have like a few minutes. Do you have anything specific you want to talk about? Do you want to make recommendations? I mean, I'm always glad to shout out what I continue to think is one of the most underrated <laughs> dark fantasy series which you actually uh convinced you to read the first book and that's ed mcdonald's uh oh yeah uh, Raven's mark trilogy yeah 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 yeah. i really liked it i I have the second book it's it's on my tbr shelf (laughs) i do want to i do want to read more of it that was an interesting one i think the reason that one stands out to me and continues to be the one where no time goes by and i still underappreciated i still it still stands out to me as being unique because as much as i love abercrombie and we all know i love abercrombie Abercrombie's setting is one that we've seen a million times. It's you know sort of Machiavellian, vaguely European swords and sorcery backdrop, which is entirely unoriginal. <laughs> it's really his character with this. It's so fantastic. But Ed McDonald, the world building and the magic concepts and the the beasts and the nuclear fallout zone of magic that he yeah. built there and the industrialized use of magic, where it's basically used as electricity, like all of that is just, I have never read anything like it. Yeah, no, it's a really interesting one. I really enjoyed the, the world building. And I think he's somebody who writes really interesting female characters. Mm -hmm. I always appreciate it when you get male authors who write women as people, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know? Okay. I mean, this could be a whole other conversation, but. Part two next week. (laughs) (laughs) But sometimes you get these authors who will write women and I read it and I'm like, this was so clearly a guy who wrote this woman. (laughs) And uh, on the one hand, there's the guys who write women who just, you know, have no agency and only exist for the sake of the hero, 
And that's a problem. Male authors take note. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you also have male authors who write women who have a personality and have agency, but some of the things that they think or say, I'm like, that is such a guy thing to think or say. <laughs> like a woman in this circumstance probably would not be thinking that. That brings to mind um, one, a movie that I also think is really underrated. And if you haven't seen it, I highly, highly recommend it. It's called Stage Beauty. And it's about the point in history where women were now going to be allowed to be on stage, like the moment when that changed. Because all, you know, we always had been playing women's roles. So the main right. characters in it are Billy Crudup and Claire Danes. And Billy Crudup was, his career was playing women. And Claire Danes always worked backstage, like his costumes and his makeup. And now she's going to be the first female actress on stage. And he was always famous for dying beautifully. And she was a big fan of his and a big fan of, and the sort of the through play throughout the movie is Othello. And at one point she tells him, I always hated the way that you died because... A woman wouldn't die like that. A woman would fight. <laughs> and I just love that because he was just, he loved the idea of being a woman because women do everything beautifully. And she was like, no, we don't. <laughs> we would fight. <laughs> That's so interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think that this is, it, it's so fascinating to me. Whereas you can tell when you read a book by a male author where I'm like, you clearly know women and mm -hmm. really like have women in your life that you speak with and know well and engage with because like you write, like you, you know, like you have a decent understanding of what women are like. I don't know. Actually, how I'm, very, how I'm very excited for you to, because I'm sure you will eventually get to Joe Abrahami's new series because he mm -hmm. incorporates very prominently both menstruation and pregnancy as like lived experiences. And the way he wrote about pregnancy, I was like, dude, I think you're a bigger expert on this than I am. And I got the parts. Like, <laughs> how, that's very realistic. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> that's interesting. No, I'm really interested to read read more from him. And I, I also think, I mean, some people disagree with me on this, but I feel like Jay Kristoff does a decent job of writing female characters. Not perfect, but like relatively good compared to a lot of other male authors there's certainly worse offenders it's it's more the ex, like extended sex scenes of a 16 year old written by a 40 year old male that we're like oh yikes territory <laughs> uh, I mean, you know <laughs> there's just something inherently ick about that <laughs> I, I get it i yeah for those who are wondering they're talking about the never night series um which yeah, I, I I can see that. The fact that she's, I mean, why did she need to be 16? She didn't yeah. really need to be 16. She could have been 18. <laughs> like, there's not really a reason for it. But maybe there was a reason at the time. He thought it was a good idea. I don't know. <laughs> well, obviously, <laughs> that was a good idea. <laughs> obviously, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, and then, like, I this is science fiction, but I recently read um, uh, To Sleep in a Sea of Stars by Christopher mm -hmm. Paolini, mm -hmm. author of Aragon, his first adult science fiction space opera thing mm -hmm. and I I thought it was so funny because the protagonist in it is a woman and occasionally there would be things that I'm like what like this is so a guy writing this I think a great example is she she ends up with this alien suit thing and one of her first concerns, she's got this like alien thing taking over her body right and like one of her first concerns is oh let me check out my nether regions. Am I going to be able to like have intercourse without affecting men's genitals in a no. negative, in a bad way? And I'm like, no, no, <laughs> this is not the first thing that a woman would be checking under these circumstances. Like, <laughs> it's just like things like little stuff, you know, it's not the whole book or anything, little stuff like that where I'm like, no. <laughs> Nope. Well, I think one of the most interesting, like, that kind of brings me back to Joe Abercrombie because one of the things he does, and this isn't just for women, this is for everything that he writes. He mm -hmm. was in some interview, he was talking about how when he was first kind of like putting pen to paper and he wrote something very like flowery and like very writerly where he's like describing something with like a bajillion similes, metaphors and analogies. And it's just very extra. <laughs> and I think it was his mother because uh, he said something about how like the the sky was like, you know, a sapphire cloth with diamonds or something to describe the starry night. <laughs> And his mom was like, does it look like that, though? Does it? Is that true? <laughs> and he was like, no. So then that's the question he asks himself for every single thing he writes, whether it be just a description of something or something that somebody just said or felt. Is it true? Mm -hmm. some, is, the, is that real? <laughs> and if it's not, he doesn't write it. <laughs> is it true? There you mm -hmm. go, guys. 
I think that's like a perfect way to wrap up dark fantasy. <laughs> is it true? Yeah. Is humanity really like this? <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> yeah. I think that's what this genre does. Thank you, Leanna, for joining me. This was super fun chatting about this. And to everyone, again, this has been Chapter 3 Podcast. I'm your host, Bethany. You can find Leanna on YouTube at Leanna's Library. And you can follow us on Twitter at Chapter 3 Podcast with a number three. And you can also find me over on YouTube at Beautifully Bookish Bethany. The next episode will be available in two weeks. Thanks so much for listening.